So you took the Top Gun course and then became an instructor like back to back? You didn't go back to the No, the no, no, no. <laughs> This 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 used to be classified. We we never talked about how we picked our, our replacements, but we picked our own replacements. Uh, to, my understanding is that the only you know at that time only the Top Gun and the Blues picked who came back on the team, so to speak, for the Blues and for us on yeah. the staff, as we call it. And after every class uh, on Friday, we graduate the class. We'd spend hours and hours on how to make the next class better. You know, we had a list of to do's and we had assigned people. You, you take care of this, you take care of that. And the last thing we did was we ranked everybody. We ranked all the, the eight pilots and the reels. And then we went to our master list, you know, and ranked them, put them in the rank of where we saw them, you know, for future in case, like in my case, they needed someone to replace somebody that left all of a sudden. And uh, so that that's how that. Evolved so you went. Ended. You went in the Tomcat first. Like you went just. I went as a to student. Tomcat in 1981. I went. Uh, okay. I think the November class in, in 81, and flew uh, the five week course in the F14. Went back uh, to the squadron, and then you know BF2, same thing. And now we're talking two years down the road. 1983 is beginning of 83. January is when all this happened, and I went to the Top Gun staff. So yeah, there was a break in between. Was it anything like? Top Gun the movie was there was it a competition or was it just you know we're teaching the ACM oh god no 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 um, no it wasn't As a matter <laughs> of fact if uh, you, you wouldn't last very long in the fighter community you know if you had if you were abrasive or, or, or had a, an attitude so to speak uh, I think the neat part about it is that if you're if you were good you didn't have to speak it's a small community everybody knew who the good guys were you know and right. and the average guys or whatever and you had a lot of great good guys but you know you do have guys that maybe should have been doing something else but uh uh for the most part no it, it, it was pretty cool it's pretty good so and i know you're going to get to that with the, the new talk well, no, but- if we can get to that uh, yeah. Was it a, a an instructor course? Like, were, was the whole intent for you to be able to go back and teach when you got back to the fleet? Is that kind of like, were the you intent? In no, the whole intent, yeah, the, the, whole, the intent of the fighter weapon school is to make, is take hopefully the best, you know, pilots in the squadron and make them better. You know, I, those guys could be my wingmen in the next war or the next conflict that we have uh, are just off the cruise and, you know, something can go wrong. You want the best pilot up there with you and the best reel with you, you know, you want the best crew. And that was really what Top Gun was all about, introducing them to uh, what the threats were, the new threats, the evolving threats. I mean, a lot of it was classroom. We did a lot of lectures and then we went out and flew the jet, you know, and uh, when I first got there, man, you know, I'm going to Top Gun, man. You know, it's great. I'm going to be instructor there. It's like awesome. My first flight, my first introduction, you know, we had a series of flights to, to train in the A4 and in the A5. I went out against Dan Driscoll, sports group. What a hell of a guy, Marine. And uh, he was actually my boss. He, he was the operations officer and I was assistant officer. He kicked my ass. I mean, <laughs> we were out in two A fours, and I'm sitting there going, "What the hell am I doing wrong?" I mean, I'm I feel I'm flying the airplane to the limits, you know, and I'm, and it's like something's not right here, you know, something's not right. And I I was pissed at myself, you know, and uh, so we land and we're, we get out of the jets, and he's laughing at me. He goes, "How'd you like that?" And I said, "Got my ass kicked," and he said. We're going to talk about it when we go in, you know. So we got in there and, and uh, Spartan, you know, he gave me the secret handshake. He said, uh, the F-4 is a well-built airplane. So I said, what I did and what most Top Gun instructors do, and don't tell anybody this because you're not supposed to do this. <laughs> like, like nobody's going to know, but he puts the flaps down. You got a clean wing, but as soon as you start turning and slowing down, the flaps come down and it changes. Changes the aircraft considerably. The performance is unbelievable. The turn rate you can get out of that. So uh, from that moment on, I became one of the secret handshake guys, and I'd always put the flaps down in A4, and it was a different freaking airplane. I used to do that in F-14, and you know, especially getting a flat scissors. And I'm sure most of your folks know what a flat scissors is if they watch your channel enough. But uh, 
eventually back in my day, you know, it wasn't shoot and not see the guy and see him explode. It, we were just getting into all aspect weapons and stuff. So you're usually going to have to get somewhere in the beam on somebody, you know, to get a good missile shot or a grazing snapshot, or if you can, if he's really bad, you can get in there and track him with a good gunshot. And so eventually you're probably going to end up getting into, you know, some sort of a, a slow speed fight. And, uh, I don't know. It, 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 it's just a lot of fun to get to perform the airplane. But uh, the F-14 was it had a really fragile system for the flaps. So you had to be really careful. So if I were being with a F-15 and a flat scissors, and he was starting to do this, and I bunted the airplane to unload a little bit and put my flaps down. And uh, I we went from here to here. I started slowing down and moving up and ballooning them. Above. That's how significant, you know, the flaps were in improving performance in the slow speed regime. You had to remember, you got to put them up when you start, you know, dropping the nose and stuff. The F-14 had a really weak uh, flap system. And, uh, before I got to Miramar, they ended up, a guy came, did that and uh, went into the downwind break and ended up, crash in the airplane. I think one of them died and get out. They had, when he put the flap, went to go to put the flaps down, they came out asymmetrically because he broke one of the uh, levers for the, the flap when uh, he was out in the area. And, and so that was kind of a taboo. The, the unwritten rule, rule was not to do it. But I'm a believer that I want to know everything the airplane can do. If my life is going to depend on this, I want to know everything I have to do to make that airplane better for me when I'm in it. One of the things about the F-14 was kind of nice. Uh, you remember the first movie that, you know, the guy just does an instantaneous fly right by, Yeah. 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 It actually could do that. And I mean, most of our airplanes can, but the F-14 got a lot of effective lift between the engine nacelles. There's a lot of area in there. 12 feet, I think, between center line and center line, nine feet, engine to engine. It was very, very asymmetric, but it gave you a lot of lift. So, and instantaneous lift is predicated on wing loading. So mm -hmm. you could do this one time, get a really good move out of it, you know, and like the, doing the movie. But the problem is you give up all your energy. So it's really not a tactical move uh, right. to do that. But it was good Hollywood stuff, you know, so obviously they ended up doing that. But uh, I just want to talk briefly about the difference in, and you know both, because the Air Force philosophy and the Navy philosophy on training and what we train to. Uh, you know, the Air Force fixed base, you know where the threat is. You have multiple aircraft there. The Navy on a carrier, uh, I'll give you my example. On the Ranger, we had, our BF-2 had 12 F-14s to its aim, but we couldn't put all 12 on the airplane, I mean, on the aircraft carrier. So we took them out to QB once we got past Hawaii over to QB and we took through it, three of them and uh, put them at QB point. So we had a beach dead at QB with three airplanes, which you got to do by the way, which is kicking ass because I had three airplanes awesome. at my disposal. It was fun. But uh, so we had nine on board the airplane from each fighter squadron. I was in VF2, we had VF1 had nine aircraft as well. And that's what we lived with. You know, it's not like the Air Force that has line after line after line of airplanes ready to go. And quite frankly, you know this from your time in the F-18, even though you had nine, doesn't mean you had nine available up and ready. Sometimes you go down, I might launch by myself. My wingman might launch if I'm, you know, not ready to go. We go up and fly a mission, hour and a half, uh, maybe a little bit longer, come back in. They launch two more from here each squadron. So now you got four airborne. So that means you have five more on the ship. Hell, you might have all five of them down. You know, you might have them down in the hangar bay and they can't get them up right now. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things, problems that you run into on board an aircraft carrier that you don't have on board, you know, when you're on a base. And man, it is unbelievable. The operation on an aircraft carrier to see that thing work. And when it's working well, there's nothing like it. It's amazing. And what's even more amazing is that the reason that it works so well is because you have 18 to 22 to 25 year old kids making it work, you know, and they're busting their tails and working long hours and, and not making the money for it. But there is a true dedication in it. That's that's part of what makes the carrier, the carry out so amazing is to see it all come together and realize it's young kids doing it, you know. 
So yeah, once again, the Navy awesome. training, military training, you just can't beat it. You just can't beat it. That's awesome. <laughs> the F-14 carried about 16,200 pounds of fuel internally, you know, give or take. 22, 23, 2,400 pounds or gallons, seven pounds per gallon and divide it out. You can uh, come to your own number. But in zone five afterburner with both engines, it burned over 2,000 pounds a minute of fuel. Okay. Wow. So in zone five, this is at sea level. You got to qualify all this. At zone five, you could actually, in zone five afterburner at sea level, burn all of your internal fuel, even if you, if you could take off and not lose any fuel. You could burn that 16,000 plus pounds of fuel in eight minutes. So you had to be very judicious with your use of afterburner, as, as you know. And uh, yeah. on the other hand, you could stay airborne for over three hours hanging on the blades. So from three hours to eight minutes, it's unbelievable. And that's why uh, when we're talking to these groups, we wanted to be able to super cruise. And I think uh, most people may or may not know what super cruise is. You don't have to use afterburner. Afterburner, there's a big old tube that holds the pipes that are all around the burner section, and they were pouring in, in the F-14, the example I gave you, it's 300 gallons a minute, five gallons a second into the afterburner, you know, section. And uh, it gives you thrust. I mean, it's very inefficient, but, it, you know, if you get out of there and your life's counting, depending on it, you, you use it, you know. and, and uh, But you learn how to use afterburner when and when not to as, as you fight. But uh yeah. Super cruise is an amazing thing. And, and what that means is that you don't have to use afterburner. You can go supersonic, just go on mill power. Uh, and that's what the F-22 and all your modern aircraft have. They can do that. We couldn't do that back then. So okay. it took a lot of extra fuel. To what was the fastest you went in the mid- Tomcat? I pushed it up to over Mach 2. Uh, I think my ground speed readout was 1,500-something. I Once again, I... At 1.91, the canopy is supposed to start delaminating, so they didn't want you to, you know, oh my be above that too much. But you got to try it. You got to do it, you know, at least, at least once. And, uh, you know, I've been in supersonic a number of times, but I went up the altitude and just pushed for it and just let it go. And, you know, the sensation of mock at altitude is not that great uh, because your indicator is not that great. You know, I mean, you, you're – now, supersonic on the deck is a kick, you know, and, and uh, going fast and low, that's me. I like to go fast and low and do stuff that I used to love to do to rage down there. Um, but it takes, you know, the fuel flow was, was incredible. Did, that. did so, you ever scare it, any fishermen? Oh, oh God. <laughs> You're going to make me jump ahead, man. It's, <laughs> I did. I think everybody's done that at least once. We were coming out. Of, <laughs> dude, I'm serious. We're coming out of Yuma, and you know, I had some civilian background, you know, in my past. And a lot of military guys don't realize it. You can cancel. You can cancel and go VFR. You don't have to stay on the instrument flight plans, you know. So we, we took off out of Yuma. Me and a wingman canceled and flew up to Colorado, man, just cruising. And of course. You're, you're not doing 250 knots. You're going a little bit faster. And we were having fun and low, and I swear it's, it's a true story. I'm sitting there, and it's one of the fingers that come off the, you know, hauling ass, and it wasn't very high. And uh, I see this guy fishing in front of me, and he's his back is to me, and he's in a little boat standing up fishing. And it's too late. He, he just came up. We are going pretty fast, and he came up on it quickly. And the last thing I remember – Oh, last thing I saw was he did that. <laughs> he did that. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, you know, I don't know if he went overboard. I don't know what happened after that. Oh boy. I didn't want to know. I just wanted to get out of there, you know, and, and move on. But uh, yeah, I had to do that story like that. That is so, awesome. I'm sure you well, probably do too. Yeah, right. well, different different eras, which that's why this is so interesting, is because the eighties were awesome for a fighter pilot in general. There's nothing yeah. Nothing like it. You're right, Mover. We talked a little bit about that. And uh, I think I hit the end of the good times at a lot of points in my career. And Top Gun grew after I left. Shortly thereafter, uh, we had tried it. We had 20 initiatives that we wanted to attain. And one of them was to be uh, Echelon 2 Command so we could bypass uh, our funding. Sometimes they didn't want to give us our own money. And we had to take, you know, the 
the uh, class up to China Lake or to Fallon, and we had to get BOQ and do all that stuff. And it was like pulling teeth to get our own money. And we're like, yeah. come on, man. One time being a, you know, a, a J.O., I, I felt like I was invincible. So the skipper said, Oregon, they don't, you know, they want to fund this uh, debt. And I said, well, skipper, shit, screw it. Tell them we're not going. Tell them we're not going to do it. We're going to just shut the class down, you know. We can't tell them that. I said, well, then we got to go. Are you going to pay for it? You know, you got a credit card, you know. And we eventually got it. But it, we got so tired of that that one of our initiatives was to become Echelon 2. Well, along with Echelon 2, you get a lot more people, you know, dilutes instead of nine pilots, 11 pilots, 14 pilots, you're up to 20 plus pilots. And and uh, what that means is less flight time. It, it might mean less lecture time and this and that. It might ease your uh, load in other areas. But man, we're there to fly. You know, we want to fly. Yeah. And I, I was looking at my logbook. There were months I got 40, 50 hours. There was a lot of months like that. And I don't think you can say the same thing nowadays you know i mean no, no. i'm reading stuff that says that they're just barely getting enough time to stay proficient 100 hours is like the minimum but also the goal because a year a year a year oh my god a year oh a year. man no no no, no a no, year no. especially no, that, like that, you talk about fifth gen like raptor pilots you're lucky if they're getting 100 hours a year at all um we used to make fun of other countries because they didn't get you know, 80, 90 hours a year. Now it's like, man, that's us. But that's insane. I, I digress. Back, let's go back to Top Gun. You flew the A4 and the F5 at the same time, or you dual qual? We did. Uh, no, did you no, fly the F14 as an instructor, or how did that work? You could fly. We, you know, we flew on the staff. We had F4s, uh, A4s, and F5s. Our F5s were maintained by Northrop, so they were hardly ever down. Except I did that PM Magazine segment somewhere in 83, 84, which is like eating magazine. It's like, I need to be back to do this interview. I'm in Yuma, and the damn jet goes down. It's like, oh, man. So oh, anyway, got it fixed, got back. But uh, I'm sweating my rear off when we go for the interview and stuff. Uh, that's another story that we can talk about on our own over a beer one time. But typical Hollywood stuff. They wanted me to run around with my shirt off, you know, and – Get some video of that. I'm going, hey, yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Oh, right. wow. So yeah, Oregon, yeah. Oregon is the inspiration for the volleyball scene. How no, often, no, 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 no. How often did well. you play shirtless volleyball? Let's talk about no. that. Is that this normal? Is well before that. But that, when I told the uh, uh, <laughs> director, was I said, I have to live here, man. You guys are just visiting. I said, there's no way in hell I'm going to do that. You know, but that, that's typical, typical Hollywood. They want to sensationalize everything. And, you know, one of the, the neat parts, I'm, I'm moving ahead a little bit. One of the neat things about the original Top Gun was that we had a lot of say. And Tony Scott, the director, was very flexible. And, and I'll give you some examples when we start talking about that. But uh, letting us decide what was going to happen, you know. And uh, that was cool. We flew the A4. The F-5, we had the E's and F's, and uh, if you could find a fleet squadron to sponsor you, a few guys did, you could maintain currency in the F-14 and go fly that. Oh, but did you do that? No, I, I didn't, we didn't have time. There was no time. <laughs> I mean, we were always, you have to remember, we were, we were doing ground jobs, uh, the school, our, I had four lectures over my three years at Top Gun, and a lecture takes about two months to get to present to the staff, we call it a murder board. Um, my F, my one v one lecture was three hours long. We did it without cards, without you know, you'd sit there and flick in the the right slide. And it, it, it was a polished product. I mean, I'm I'm very proud of that. Top Gun was amazing. We had some amazing people, but a Top Gun murder board was insane. The Top Gun instructors there and <laughs> beef. <laughs> if beef ever watches this. B. Flannery, he was the guy who took over one we run from. So he'd be back there, uh, uh, excuse me, if this happens, blah, 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 you know. And, and uh, you know, if I didn't, he's trying to catch me. And, and if I didn't know the answer to it, I'll get back to you on it. So we take a break, you know, 10 minute break. And sure enough, you get back in. And I'm just trying to remember the rest of the damn uh, what I'm going to say. And there's beef. Uh, did you get that answer for me? You know, that uh, I had 10 minutes ago. I'm going, oh, man, you know, that was one of the debrief items was that. 
hey, if you tell somebody you're going to do something, you need to do it, you know. And uh, yeah. so it, it was pretty brutal. Uh, I don't know if you remember the congressman who happened to be from Georgia, which is where I'm living now, who was talking to the admiral and was worried that Guam was going to tip over. You remember that? Yep. Well, that admiral oh, was yeah. about rat. And uh, I, I, I actually texted Rat, texted uh, Rat, and said, uh, "How did you keep a straight face?" Because he was very professional. <laughs> That's a great guy. And he texted back. He said, "Top Gun Murder Board." So <laughs> you know, he's able to just be stoic and say, "I, I was laughing my ass off because Guam's going to tip over." That it's so disappointing. Yeah. Our political class. Some of these people are just. Oh yeah. I'm not going to get started that, but. Uh, our first week, the entire first week at Top Gun was 1v1. And uh, we had talk, alluded to that about, you know, you're coming off the carrier, you might be by yourself. You might be with another wingman. You might be with uh, VF-1 airplanes, which, by the way, I love Air Force standardizations. You guys could take somebody from Germany and bring them over to the States, and he knows exactly what the other guy's going to do. I'm on the same ship. In VF-1 and VF-2, we had different tactics. We used different had a different philosophy about how to fly the airplane. And the reason for that is the COs were competing for the next level. 1v1, uh, oftentimes you're going to get to, at least in my day, now, nowadays a lot are, you know, uh, beyond visual range and, and uh, they shoot and die and you go away and go to the bar. Back in my day, it was a lot of, <laughs> it's true, man. You know, you look at all these missiles and stuff and it's just so different. And we had to, we we would fight and we're, you know, shoot for that rear core and stuff. So it was a little longer and, and, uh, which is why we emphasize one V one more, I think. And, uh, it was all about energy management and that's why Boyd is, man, he's, I'm a big fan of his, you know, the work that he did. And, uh, you know, I, and when, when I say that, I, an example for any, if there are any laymen watching, you know, a rock, just put a rock on the desk and it's a rock. It has no energy. It's not going anywhere. But if I took a rock up here and hold it, there's potential energy there. And when I release it, there's kinetic energy and it has, you know, it's going to hit with a force. It's going to do some damage. I'll give an F-14, A-4 example, acceleration uh, and 1G uh, for the A-4 could take him a minute and a half from 250 to 450, whereas the F-14 could do it in 30 something seconds. And, uh, but so when you fought the A4, you really didn't want to turn with them, even though it's fifties technology, the A4 was a mean machine turning, but there's, if you look at the curves, you can find a way to beat them and we'd extend out, you know, we'd out energy him. That's what we do. An A4 at sea level where he couldn't use, uh, potential energy. In other words, uh, not only is your jet engine giving you energy, altitude is giving you energy. You can trade altitude for airspeed, you know, I could have, I could shut my engine off at 30,000 feet and continue to fly, you know, because I, there, the jet still has energy. And that's one of the things with an A4, you had to be careful that at altitude, but an A4 on the deck, because he couldn't use that air altitude for airspeed anymore. And if he bled any at all, it took him forever at 1G because you can't unload and on the deck. So he's a dead man. I mean, you could turn with an A4 at sea level and beat him easily. If you turn with him at 15,000 feet, you better watch out because it was a main fight. A very, have you fought the A4 single seat? No, but I've heard I've heard so much about the A4. It, you know, it's just an awesome turning aircraft. It was a kick in the rear, uh, <laughs> with a few a few exceptions. I'm gonna go back when I first got the, the Top Gun. I'm I'm looking and, and uh, they had leather on the top of their helmets, and I'm going, what the hell is the leather for? And I forget who I was asked, but it might have been shoes. It's like, you'll find out. And I did. Yeah. That A4 cockpit is like, you're sitting in it like this. And I was worried if I had to eject whether my legs were going to come with me because you slide into it under the instrument panel. Very small. But they had uh, mechanical slats on the front of the jet. So what that is, is this, like a flap on the back. The slats will hang down and change the characteristics and slow speed of the uh, the wing for you so you go down even slower in the landing configuration but they'd also come out airborne and the f uh, a4 roll rate was 720 degrees a second wow. two complete yeah. revolutions a second it was a rolling beast and the only problem was when you're pulling 
if one slat came out and the other one didn't, it was violent because the airplane was just whoop. And we called it the water seeking mode because it was so violent. And that's why we had leather on our helmets because our head would hit the canopy like that. Oh, and we wow. didn't want to scratch up the canopy. And I found that out the hard way as well. But <laughs> we'd go out there and uh, we'd always do a, a slat check. And I remember 56 would always, the, it would roll up because the, the right slat would come out. So you, you, the slat check, you get there and you just pull back on the G. So it's a combination of airspeed and G-force where they come down mechanically. And like I said, if one of them came out and the other one didn't, I would do a slat check to make sure that, uh, okay, I'm in 56. I know it's going to roll off to the left. Now, it's really easy to get them in. You just bunt it. You bunt and whoo, they go back up and you, you're you flying again, you know, control book. And, uh, but man, sometimes you get pissed off. And I think I, I went four or five turns just trying to get the damn thing out of there. You know, I'm picking the rudders, I'm falling on the jet and I'm rolling like a corkscrew down toward the water. Finally had to give up and unload. I think, Karen Fulton uh, probably had the record of that. I believe he, he tried it like for seven rolls, you know, going down, which is <laughs> oh, a matter of seconds, painful. but very, yeah. very violent. Yeah. The one time that a slat departure helped me, I was fighting an F-14, this being the F-14, this being me. So I had an energy advantage. We're pretty close to the same airspeed. I didn't have enough vertical separation to prosecute the attack, so I was waiting for the lag, and once he got behind me, you know, if he turned this way, it's going to get separation. So I know he's going to keep turning into me. And uh, it was a violent slap departure. But as soon as I started pulling to make that turn and it went this way, I bun it. And by the time I bun it, he was right out in front of me. And he, he oh, wow. came back and he really going, what the hell did you do? How did you do that? I said, you know, aviation skill, you know. <laughs> I said, that was a classic slap departure. You know, I said, I've never had one work to my advantage until now. This is the first time it ever worked. Usually you're out of the fight because you're trying to recover the damn airplane and get back in. But and you know, a couple of seconds here and there, you don't yeah. you don't have that luxury. So I like I said, I was a performance guy. I really respected people that could fly the airplane. And I'm just gonna mention a few guys in the F4, and I remember Pete Pettigrew Viper, the old guy in the original movie. He became an admiral, he was a mid killer in Vietnam. Man, he could he flew a sweet F four, and the, the way you you can tell what a guy that a guy knows what he's doing is uh, in the slow speed, you know, arena, and not that that's some place you want to be, but sometimes you find yourself there. And uh, he and I fought him in the F fourteen, and I was above him watching. You know, the F fourteen is a better airplane, uh, but Pete was able to just magic with the F-4s. Like, man, that, I, I always admired that when I'm watching somebody fly a good jet, you know. And there's another guy, the uh, German Air Force would go up to George Air Force Base, and they'd always request Top Gun to come and fly against them. And we'd go and, uh, God, I an A-4. We, I would triple cycle these guys, you know, right down the engagement. You get so good at this stuff, man. And, and, uh, and, come back and do it again in the afternoon. And we have a final debrief at the end of the day. And, you know, you might have 12 engagements that you're debriefing from the, the morning or, you know, and, and you get there and just talk about it. So and that's why they love this. But there was a guy in F4s there that flew the jet really well. Um, same thing, you know, you're getting slow. Don't want to do that in F4, but you can tell when a guy knows what he's doing. In the F14, I, uh, Brian Flannery, beef, who was the guy I took over one we won, won from? Same thing, same thing. Getting slow, and you know, you watch the F fourteen. You go, he's gonna, he's gonna fall out of the sky, you know. And but no, it keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming. Brings it up and brings it over. It's like that's a work of art. That guy knows yeah. exactly what he's doing, you know. It just some of these guys yeah. were amazing, and and I have to uh, compliment Beef on that. And not once again, some if you're good, you can entice guys to get into a slow fight. Sometimes uh, you might end up there when you don't want to and you're going to die. Other times you're trying to trick a guy to get into your arena because you know, I know what I'm doing here and he probably doesn't at these slow airspeeds. So, uh, and, and these guys are masters of it. Mm -hmm.